our presenter is Lee Kalksitz. He is an associate professor at Washington State University's Department of Horticulture, and his work for, focuses on tree fruit physiology, abiotic stress, plant nutrition, and impacts of pre-harvest environment on post-harvest physiology. All yours, Lee. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna kind of talk about some work I've been doing on rootstocks and the effect they have on, on plant nutrition is disorder incidents. This is part of work that's been part of the NC140, which is the National Rootstock Evaluation Project. So there's a whole lot of different states and collaborators involved in that. And then we also had a specialty crop research initiative, which was a, a federally funded project for five years that just finished up last year to look specifically at um, the role of rootstocks in nutrient uptake and distribution in, uh, in Honeycrisp and other apple varieties. So we've, we've seen over the last decade uh, a huge proliferation of new rootstocks available to growers. Um, and within that comes a whole lot of new choices. You were making choices of, of fire blight resistant, woolly apple aphid resistant, replant resistant uh, varieties of rootstocks that are available now compared to some of the older, older rootstocks that you've traditionally used over the years. And then also a whole range in dwarfing cap capability. So a bit of uh, ability to, to find the specific rootstock that fits well with your soil type whether it's replant or, or, or virgin soil, um, planting densities, training systems, you can really tailor what rootstocks you need. And, and along with that, now that we have rootstocks that have similar vigor classes, that have good traits, we can now start to look at, well, what other things can we stack on top of that? Some, one of those things is, is nutrition. And that's where this project was, was focused on. So nutrition is important through setting up, setting up fruit set, setting up sizing, and setting up good fruit quality at harvest. So early on in the season, uptake is really critical. As those soils start to warm up, you get a flush of root growth coming out into the soil, and those roots start to take up nutrients as they use up their reserves that were, that were available to them through bloom. They, then they have to take up nutrients to fulfill their needs. So they take up nutrients um, from the soil and distribute it through the water stream of the tree. So it either goes to the leaves or to the fruit. And when it goes to the fruit, it goes through these, these uh, vessels. So this is, we, we took a pink dye, much like you'd see in those really pink flowers you see at the florist. It's the same type of dye. It pulls up through the fruit and the amount of dye or the amount of vessels that are dyed indicates the activity or the functionality of those vessels. And early on in the season, it, they're really active. They're taking a lot of nutrients up into the fruit and that includes calcium. So early on in the season, that fruit, that activity, that functionality of the xylem is really important for calcium delivery into the fruit. And then later on in the season, this is, this is the fruit gets larger, you see, that pink, that pink dye is not taken up, meaning that those vessels are not active later on the season. And because they're not active later on in the season, they're not able to take up calcium. So that early season is really critical for calcium uptake and very little calcium is taken up into the fruit later on in the season. So as the fruit continues to grow and continues to expand, it dilutes that calcium pool. So if you go in to the into July with low calcium, it's really difficult to fix because the, the fruit is not taking up any calcium. And then the distribution between leaves and fruit matters because the more leaves you have and it follows the water stream, so leaves use a lot more water than fruit does early on in the season, that more of that calcium is gonna end up in the leaves if you have a lot of vigor or if you have a low crop load. And that's where you get those imbalances. And then it's not just the calcium part of it, but it's the other nutrients. So when you have a lot of vigor, you have a lot of, a lot of photosynthesis. You have a lot of photosynthesis, you have a lot of carbon that you can put into fruit. So if you have a low crop load and a lot of vigor, that's a lot of carbon that can be put into fruit growth and you get really rapid fruit growth. That's where you have large size with, with, uh, with large or small crop loads. 
And along with that comes potassium and nitrogen, magnesium, plant and mobile nutrients that get loaded into the fruit along with the carbohydrates. And that creates those imbalances you see with nutrient related problems. So when you think about how rootstocks affect fruit quality, how they affect nutrition, they can have direct effects on the ability of that rootstock to mine nutrients from the soil or take up nutrients from the soil. Some rootstocks might differ in that. And then there's the indirect effects, the effects that the rootstock has on crop load or it has on vigor that can affect the distribution of nutrients in the upper part of the tree. So when you think about direct effects, I think some of the best examples when you start to compare rootstocks of similar vigor. So, um, you know, some of the good examples is G41 and M9. G41 and M9 are similar, similar vigor classes, but they end up with, with differences in bitter pit incidence. This is some work that was done in New York. It, uh, in, in the work we've done in Washington shows even greater differences between G41 and M9 where G41 has much greater bitter pit incidence compared to M9, even though they're the same vigor class. And that's primarily because they have differences in their ability to take up nutrients, but it's not always consistent. So this, we see that the G41 and M9 have roughly the same ratios. But we've also seen that it, it in Washington, work both on WA38, and then I'll show Honeycrisp right after this, that G41 has a higher uptake of nitrogen and potassium compared to M9, leading to bigger ratios and, and greater disorders, uh, disorder incidents like green spot. And this is work that Bernardita Salato did and published in, in Hort Science last year or two years ago. And this is work that my PhD student did from 2017 to 2019. She did work looking at, again, uh, four different rootstocks. We had highly, highly more semi-vigorous G890 and ultra dwarfing bud nine, but we also had G41 and M9. So same vigor class, but very different ratios. So on the top here, we can see fruit size was, you know, large fruit size for Honeycrisp, 342 and 328 grams. And, and then in 2019, it was 305 and 279. So really not a large difference in fruit size. But when we start to look at the potassium and magnesium concentrations, we see G41 has higher magnesium and potassium relative to M9. And we see that both in 2019 and 2018. So G41 has a tendency to take up potassium a lot more than M9 does. And we also see that some of the work we've done that also takes up nitrogen at, at a similar, similar amount. And that leads to differences in bitter pit incidence. And we've seen this, and this is from Washington State. Um, again, following up on that work that Nadia did in 2018, 2019. So we have G41 and M9 on the left. Bottom left is looking at bitter pit incidence, where bitter pit incidence is the yellow part of the bar. So it's a breakdown, a percentage of either not or having bitter pit. The yellow part of the, the yellow bar is bitter pit and the orange is clean or not having bitter pit. And you can see M9, same vigor. So M9 and G41, same vigor class, very different, very strong differences in overall bitter pit incidence where G41 has almost 50% of the fruit with bitter pit, whereas M9 is somewhere between 10 and 20%. So then the indirect effects that root socks can have, a lot of it has to do with precocity, biennial bearing, and then I'll go into some of the, the relationships with vigor. But that ability for that rootstock to consistently set that crop year after year is really important because crop load is such a critical, critical component for plant nutrient ratios and controlling bitter pit. So as soon as you get into a light crop situation, so less than five fruit per centimeter squared trunk cross-sectional area, that you start those potassium to calcium ratios start to rapidly increase because that fruit size increases, it dilutes the calcium pool, and you end up with those imbalances leading to bitter pit. And I'll, I'll kind of give this situation of why, why it's really important to get a rootstock that is precocious 
and that is consistent year after year. So you need to manage that crop load, but you also need a rootstock that allows you to manage that and get that right year after year. So if you have a biennial cycle where you have an on year and an off year, it's, it's not just that you're getting that decrease in yield, but you're also losing, with Honeycrisp, you're also losing that much more to bitter pit in that off year. So you might, in an on year, you might have 80% of your trees that are on and 20% that are off. And it's really those 20% that are off that's driving that small amount of bitter pit that you see. It's not all those on trees. Those on trees almost have no bitter pit because they're, they're on, they have their crop load set. You've had to thin them down to meet their crop load. It's those 20% so those that are off that's driving all your bitter pit risk for that year. So then when you go into your off year, if you're, if you're in a biennial, biennial bearing pattern in the orchard where you have 20% that are on, now 80% that are off, well, those 80% of the trees are now driving all your bitter pit risk and you end up with lower yields because you have 80% off, but then also this really high bitter pit risk. So trying to even that out and getting that right is gonna have way more return, more, way more bang for your buck than almost anything else you can do to control bitter pit and control calcium levels in your orchard. Crop load is the, is the number one. And rootstock can have a role in that because rootstocks have very variation in precocity. Bud 9 returns much stronger and is much more precocious than some of the other rootstocks out there. This is some work we did in WA38 in George. So this is the first three years of a, of a orchard that was planted in 2017, first three years of cropping looking at the yields. And so we had we had 10 different rootstocks. G41 was our commercial standard and, and a whole lot of other test Geneva rootstocks. But I just wanted to show the role that rootstocks can have in controlling that biennial bearing. So first year crop, relatively small, still filling its space. 2020 was, was our, our on year, our big year. We set a really heavy crop. It was 75 bins an acre in this, in this block. And then we were thinking that, well, it's going to come back pretty light the next year. And it did not bad. Um, I think our biggest reduction was about 50%. But there was variability in how those rootstocks returned in the next year. So we had some rootstocks that had no difference between 2020 and 2021. So G4809, G5030, both those returned pretty well. But there were other rootstocks that that we're definitely entering into an off-year pattern, G4010, um, uh, and and G41 was another one, and 5087. So we have we have rootstocks that return well after a heavy year, and rootstocks that don't. So there's variability in that. So knowing how those rootstocks behave is something we still really need to dial in and get figured out. But it's these are long-term research projects because you need many years of data to be able to understand this. And then the how rootstocks affect vigor. So you 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 select the rootstock to meet your goals of being able to fill that space based on your planting density, based on your um, uh, your your training system to be able to fill that space by year three. And if you end up in a situation where you have too much vigor because you select a more vigorous rootstock, or or that rootstock is too vigorous for the site. You have too much organic matter um, and maybe it's tapped into a water table or something like that and you have a lot more vigor that can create a lot of problems so really matching that rootstock with that specific site is is really important there's no no perfect rootstock there's just a perfect rootstock for your location and this this role that that vigor has in bitter pit is pretty pretty clear and rootstocks and their ability to control vigor so this is a, a rootstock trial that we did for three years looking at, at the role of uh, vigor on bitter pit incidents. And you see this pretty clear relationship within one site. But that doesn't mean 814 is a bad rootstock or 969 is a, is a mo moderate rootstock. It just has more vigor than bud nine. So in our site, bud nine performed well. But in say a, a site that's sandier and you need that extra horsepower to push through and fill its space and, and produce a, 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 a proper amount of growth, um, 
a more vigorous rootstock might be might be suitable. So it's just matching vigor with with the site. And I just kind of use this as an example of why that site choice is important. So this is a rootstock rootstock trial across two 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 different locations in Washington. So site A was a was a, a virgin site with lots of vigor. It was grassland, uh, dissed in. There's a lot of relatively a lot of organic matter for Washington, a lot of nutrients built up in the soil. So those trees had a lot of a lot of vigor across all rootstocks. And you can see in that first year of cropping, bitter pit incidence was was high across all rootstocks pretty evenly. Site B was a replant site and it was a, a, a rough uh, rougher textured soil, so more sand in the soil, more rock, and the vigor was lower. And you can see all across that whole whole set the, of of rootstocks, no matter what rootstock it is, the the bitter pit incidence was was much more much more reduced, just because it was reduced vigor. And when we when we we just had the the session or the the panel on on irrigation, and it what we also know is that rootstocks can modulate water status and how trees perceive water and how trees use water from the soil. They have different rooting depths, they have different root architectures, and they have the they have a ability to control vigor in the tree, and that control of vigor controls the water status and how the plants perceive water. So bud nine, which is the ultra dwarfing rootstock will generally produce smaller fruit because it's, it is inducing a water stress on, on the scion itself that compared to a more vigorous rootstock. So rootstocks have the ability to change how plants perceive water and you need to irrigate each rootstock differently. So this is just showing the relationship with shoot growth. So vigor on the bottom and stem water potential, which is a measure of water stress. So the more negative it is, the more water stress the tree is and lower vigor. And that's not, that's not a change in how we water, that's just a change in how the rootstock controls shoot growth and how it manipulates how plants perceive water. And this is some work that Victor Blanco, my postdoc, did. Um, this is part of the, the NC140 National Rootstock Group. We had 10 different sites in and two different Honeycrisp plantings, 2010 and 2014, across 10 different locations, three different years, where we looked at bitter pit incidents and nutrient ratios and crop load. And we kind of came out with something that is consistent with what we found in some of our other research that that G41 is among the vulnerable uh, rootstocks. 814 I showed in one of the other, other figures was a high, high risk. G11 is another one. And then less, less susceptible or tolerant to bitter pit across both Honeycrisp and Fuji, Bud9, G969, G214. Those are consistent with other trials we've been doing that, that those rootstocks per, uh, persistently have the ability to reduce bitter pit compared to, to some of the other rootstocks out there. And really it's the combination of that rootstock effect and then crop load that kind of come together that um, help control bitter pit. So just kind of wrap it up. Um, really, if, if there's one thing, it's, it's crop load. And you can, use, by choosing the right rootstock, and meeting your vigor goals and getting that tree into a calm situation is going to help to eat more easily control that crop load because you're less likely to enter into that biennial pattern. Um, G41 needs to be used with caution. I know there are some people that have Honeycrisp and WA38 there out with G41. I've seen some really nice WA38 produced on G41. Uh, it just needs to be used with caution. I'm um, using it in soils. Um, where there might be high nitrogen and potassium, uh, need to be careful with that. Um, uh, avoiding overuse of potassium if it's not deficient, uh, don't use it. Um, and then avoiding highly susceptible cultivars um, on this rootstock if you can. 
we still need to do more work on identifying rootstocks that that are are less biennial and, and less likely to enter a biennial cycle. I think there's there's good evidence that there's rootstocks that have those those traits. Um, we just need to more clearly identify them. And really, it, it it does come. And I've said this a couple of times. It does come down to just matching that vigor with your site characteristics to be able to enter that enter into fill your canopy space, enter in production in third year, and get those trees into a calm, productive cycle as quick as possible. Because the quicker you do that, the quicker you're going to be able to control bitter pit through your orchard. So. Um, had, had support through Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission uh, for some of this work. Um, our collaborators, uh, Hannah Walters and Stemilk Growers, and then our national uh, funded projects that have that, that funded this work um, since 2016. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.